I'm very proud and delighted to introduce the first of these brilliant investigators, investigators uh, Luke Cantley. Uh, Luke Cantley is from the Wild Corner Medical College and will talk today about obesity, diabetes, and cancer, the PI3 kinase connection. Lou, take it away. Thank you, Frank. It's, uh, it's great to be back here at UCSF and uh, get a chance to, to uh, give you a little bit of history of, of PI3 kinase and then at the end a bit of speculation about uh, this connection that I'm suggesting here between obesity, diabetes, and cancer and what might be the molecular mechanism for this. But I want to start by acknowledging uh, some of the people who really contributed to the work uh, historically in my laboratory and also in, through collaborations. In particular, Tom Roberts and Brian Schaffhausen, uh, Malcolm Whitman, a graduate student in my lab, and David Kaplan uh, from Tom Roberts' lab, uh, who, who really worked together as a team in, in the mid-1980s to, uh, to, to really bring the discovery of pediatric kinase to the forefront. Uh, and then many other postdocs and collaborators, John Blennis in particular, uh, who uh, really did a lot of the experiments that uh, sh reveal the pathways that I'll be talking about today. So the, part, the talk within will have two parts to it. Uh, the first, uh, a bit about what PI3 kinase does, its connection with AMP-dependent protein kinase, and control of metabolism. Then the second part will focus on the link between obesity, diabetes, and cancer, and how PI3 kinase might be involved. So we discovered this enzyme in the mid-1980s, PI3 kinase, because it co-purified with a variety of oncoproteins, first with VSARC, later with polyoma middle TC SARC, and then we found it associated with a host of receptor tyrosine kinases that were known to cause cancer, including the PDGF receptor. And when we first dis uh, described the enzyme, we thought it was phosphorylating the four position of the inositol ring, because at that time, through 30 years of phosphoinositide research, the only sites known to be phosphorylated were either the four site alone or the four plus the five position of the inositol ring uh, in the species uh, PI45P2. Uh, but a, a, an observation that we made that the lipid product of the PI3 kinase migrated about a millimeter different on thin layer from that of PI4 kinase uh, led us to discover that it was actually put, put in a phosphated position not previously known to exist in nature. Uh, the three position. And this led to discovery ultimately of this triply phosphorylated lipid, uh, PI345P3, that is the second messenger that drives signaling of cell, cell growth signaling. About 10 years after that, a uh, gene was uh, identified by positional cloning as being deleted in advanced human cancers, and in fact, second only to P53 as the most commonly deleted gene in cancer. Uh, the sequence of this gene revealed that it was a phosphatase, and it was thought to be a phosphatyrosine phosphatase because of similarity, but Jack Dixon, a really brilliant enzymologist who'd worked on phosphatases for much of his career, uh, was not impressed by the specific activity of this enzyme as a phosphatyrosine phosphatase and sought other substrates and ultimately discovered that it would dephosphorylate the same position on the inositol ring uh, that PI3 kinase phosphorylates. And this then really got, uh, probably was the first time that true oncologists became interested in PI3 kinase because our work had really focused more on animal models, uh, mice and chicken viruses that cause cancers. So obviously PI3 kinase and P10 did not evolve to cause cancer. So what do they actually do? And we can learn a lot about what they do by looking through what's conserved in this pathway through evolution. And this enzyme, the PI3 kinase, the so-called class 1 PI3 kinase, which is what I'll focus on today, is conserved back to flies and worms, but not in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, and what it does, and in fact, as we've mapped out the signaling network and asked what fraction or what part of that signaling network is conserved through evolution, it's primarily the insulin IGF-1 signaling network through AKT and downstream responses that I'll get into some detail on that's highly conserved. So this enzyme really evolved to control insulin IGF-1 responses, to mediate insulin IGF-1 responses uh, in, in the, when uh, animals take up nutrients, and in particular to drive glucose into cells into the appropriate tissue so that that tissue can grow in the appropriate time. And it does so, and I'll show a bit of detail how it works, by stimulating glucose uptake and glucose metabolism. Now, this, of course, can allow cells to grow. It can use the glucose to grow. But it also 
allow cells to survive, and that's because uh, in, a, in an inappropriate environment, a cell is challenged to get enough tr nutrient in order to survive. By turning on this pathway, you can get cells to survive without anchorage dependence, hence it's important in cancer. So P10, of course, is a break on the system to allow everything to go back to homeostasis. Now what happens in diabetes is in type 2 diabetes is that there's still the cell can initially you can still make insulin but insulin cannot activate PI3 kinase in the appropriate tissues in liver in muscle and fat cells as a as a consequence there's enhanced gluconeogenesis so the liver continues to produce glucose uh, and muscle cannot take up glucose and as a consequence one develops hyperglycemia now, we, it's embarrassing that we don't actually know at the molecular level precisely how type 2 diabetes is caused. Uh, we're beginning to make some progress. It certainly is an impairment of insulin's ability to activate PI3 kinase, and there may be multiple mechanisms by which this is impaired, but the ultimate consequence and the, the, the ultimate call, uh, response to that event uh, is very clear. And in fact, a very large problem today. Now, in the case of cancers, the opposite happens. Instead of having an impairment in the ability to activate PI3 kinase, do we have another pointer? This one seems to be losing steam here. Uh, instead of an impairment in the ability to activate PI3 kinase, uh, the PI3 kinase pathway gets hyperactivated, and this can happen by a variety of mechanisms, including receptor tyrosine kinases being mutated or amplified, or B2 EGF receptor, for example. Mutations in PI3 kinase itself, amplification of the gene for PI3 kinase, or loss of P10, and other mechanisms as well that I don't have time to get into. A, a, a remarkable number of cancers have these events going on, and as a consequence, PI3 kinase and its lipid product, PIP3, are continuously activated, and this will drive glucose uptake metabolism, as, a, as well as a number of other events that allow a cell to survive in an, appropriate, in an inappropriate environment uh, and to grow uh, unrelentingly. Now, a bit of the molecular mechanism by which this happens, which comes from really a lot of work from my lab and many other labs over the last 20 years, when a growth factor like uh, insulin or IGF-1 binds to its receptor, this drives tyrosine phosphorylation of the receptor, uh, a so-called auto or autotrans phosphorylation event. In the case of insulin IGF-1 receptor, this creates a binding site for downstream coupling proteins called the IRS family, IRS-1, IRS-2, 3, and 4. These then have within them tyrosine phosphorylation sites that are ideally designed and conserved through evolution for their ability to bind extremely tightly to the SH2 domains of PI3 kinase. And as a consequence, PI3 kinase gets recruited to the membrane and activated through this interaction. And this drives then conversion of phosphatidylnositol 4,5 bisphosphate, which resides primarily at the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, to PIP3. And this, is, this we knew by 1989 or so, but we didn't know what PIP3 was doing, and it took another seven or eight years to figure that out. Uh, and ultimately, we've discovered a number of proteins, we and other labs discovered a number of proteins, mainly proteins with plexin homology domains that specifically and directly bind to this lipid, and as a consequence, are allowed, to, are recruited to the plasma membrane and activated for downstream responses. Now, most notably of this group is a protein kinase called AKT, which itself was also independently discovered as an oncogene, a, a, a mouse virus encoded oncogene. And AKT uh, binds directly to PIP3, and its upstream kinase, phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1, also has a plexomology domain that binds to the same lipid. These proteins find themselves adjacent to each other and properly oriented so the PDK1 can phosphorylate and activate AKT. Once that happens, it is not necessary for AKT to stay at the plasma membrane to remain active. It can dissociate, go, even go into the nucleus, phosphorylate a host of proteins. And at last count, in the literature, there were about 150 substrates of AKT claimed uh, from various uh, publications. And in fact, probably at least a third of those are actually correct that they really are substrates of AKT. Uh, for those of you who work on kinases, realize how difficult it is to prove that what kinase is phosphorylating what protein in vivo. But there are a few of these that we have a lot of confidence in are truly substrates of AKT from a variety of approaches and that are also highly conserved through evolution. And these include tuberin that I'll talk about in a little more detail, a transcription factor called FOXO, glycogen synthase kinase 3, 
and a protein involved in, in membrane trafficking called AS160. And I won't go into any detail of what these proteins do except to say that virtually everything that we know that insulin does in a cell can be explained by these proteins, these substrates of AKT. And in fact, almost all of insulin signaling is driven through PI3 kinase and AK2, in particular AKT isoform 2. So glucose uptake regulation, uh, increased protein synthesis, uh, uh, transcriptional regulation of gluconeogenesis enzymes, uh, and glycogen storage all ultimately can be explained by this pathway. T10, of course, then comes on and shuts it off, and as long as everything's working properly, this, the cell only responds when insulin's high, and then when insulin drops, everything goes off again. Now, this network is actually more complicated uh, than, than even the slide that I show here. I'm not going to go into great detail on this. Uh, we don't have enough time. But I will point out that there's the PI3 kinase is not only activated by receptor tyrosine kinase, but also by RAS. So when RAS gets mutated, it has the potential to activate PI3 kinase, although it tends to more activate the MAP kinase pathway and more tickle the PI3 kinase pathway. So some receptor tyrosine kinases, like insulin IGF-1, almost entirely signal through PI3 kinase, but others, like EGF receptor, tend to go through the RAS MAP kinase pathway. However, they converge in their ability to phosphorylate and inactivate the function of tuberin. Tuberin is a gap for a RAS-like protein called REB, in an analogous way to NF1 uh, being a gap for RAS. And by phosphorylating tuberin by either the AKT pathway or the MAP kinase pathway through ERK and RISC, you turn off the function of this. REB builds up in a GTP bound state and turns on a downstream protein called TOR, which you'll hear a lot about next year because Michael Hall, uh, who's uh, this year's winner, uh, one of the winners this year, uh, discovered TOR uh, by uh, examining yeast for the ability to mutate and uh, uh, be able to circumvent inhibition of growth by rapamycin, uh, the drug that's used as immunosuppressant. And so by activating TOR then, uh, this pathway will drive ultimately uh, cell growth, protein synthesis, glucose uptake, and glucose metabolism. This, this pathway has other inputs, amino acids, essential amino acids are required for this to happen, and AMP-dependent protein kinase, if cells become under energy stress, will turn off this pathway by targeting both tuberin and Raptor. And upstream of AMP kinase is a tumor suppressor called LKB1, responsible for a hamartoma syndrome called fuchs jagers disease, uh, which uh, Ruben Shaw in my laboratory identified uh, was the upstream kinase for AMP-dependent protein kinase, uh, and therefore feeds in this same network. <coughs> AMP kinase also can affect the MAP kinase pathway, a mechanism I don't have time to get into. So what's remarkable about this pathway is that everything that's in red in this network is an oncogene, as defined by uh, Bert earlier today, and everything in blue is a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, and so a lot of the common genes that we're looking at in cancer today all fit together in the same network. Of course, they have other targets, and it's far more complicated than this, but it is quite remarkable this highly conserved network through evolution uh, is the primary network by which uh, oncogenes, the tumor suppressor genes, are involved in transforming cells. Now, you can lose, as I alluded to earlier, Pooch, LKB1 was identified as a pooch jaeger gene, uh, hamartoma syndrome, and in fact, there are a number of hamartoma syndromes. These are hyperproliferative growth syndromes that are inherited due to one allele mutation in one of these tumor suppressor genes, either P10, LKB1, tuberin, or its sister protein, Hamartin, or NF1, a single allele lost in the germline will ultimately result in hyperproliferation, usually because the other gene is also mutated sporadically or otherwise suppressed. And as a consequence, these hyperproliferative events often in the gut uh, appear. And a lot of these diseases, like Calvin's disease and Fuchs-Jaeger syndromes, actually have very similar types of phenotypes. And this network begins to explain why that is so. It also suggests how we might be able to treat these diseases, because as I alluded to earlier, uh, rapamycin targets the downstream uh, act, uh, mTOR, which is activated when tuberin and or hamartin are lost. And as a consequence, it makes logical sense that that same drug, which is used as immunosuppressant, might also be useful for treating some of these hamartoma diseases. And in fact, both rapamycin and the Novartis analog of rapamycin called Everolimus, 
went into clinical trials for treating symptoms of this disease and very rapidly were approved because of improved outcome for the patients. And so this is really quite exciting. There's a disease called lymphangiomyomatosis or LAM disease that many tuberous sclerosis patients, uh, women, inv invariably uh, women, even young girls get, uh, uh, that is a, a lung disease uh, that uh, is due to a hyperproliferative event in the lung. Uh, ultimately, this disease has been fatal. Invariably, it progresses to a stage where the patients need a lung transplant. Once transplanted, the new lung is once again invaded, and so they are not truly cured by this process. However, these patients are now on these drugs and doing remarkably well. It's really exciting uh, thing for them. I was able to give a talk at a LAM meeting in the in the spring, and there are a whole group of women in the in this uh, uh, at this meeting, whom I had met four years earlier when we were working on this pathway, and they all came up to me as a group and just said, "We used to be on oxygen. We used to be on line for transplants. We now just take this pill every day," and they were, they were extremely excited about this work. So. It's uh, quite rewarding to be able to see that this kind of work is actually helping uh, people with these kinds of diseases. Now, if we go back and look at the frequency of mutations in PI3 kinase itself, in fact, there are really only one type of PI3 kinase where you see mutations, uh, and that's the PIK3CA gene. Actually, that's not strictly true. The PIK3R regulatory subunit also gets mutated, but this is the most frequent mutation. And if you look, you probably cannot read the axis here, but you can see there's 60% at the top, that a majority of uh, endometrial uterine cancers have a mutation in this gene or an amplification, in most cases a mutation. The reds indicate amplification. Cervical cancers, breast cancers, ovarian cancers, and in fact, the cancers that most commonly cause death in America typically have high rates of mutations uh, in pic 3 ca uh, So this... Uh, suggests that if we could make drugs that inhibit this, they could be useful in the clinic. If we look at the entire network, so all the nodes that I showed you in that signaling network, and ask how frequently are any of them mutated, then you get a remarkable result. So here's, again, the same cancers I talked about, ovarian breast, uh, cervical, and uterine. Of course, these are extremely high, and we're now approaching 60%. In the case of endometrial cancer, it's roughly 95% have a mutation in some node in this network, at least one, and many of them have multiple mutations. Uh, but you can see the, the tumors, the types of cancers that kill Americans uh, are very frequently, uh, more than 70, 60, 70 percent have mutations uh, in this network. Now, the prediction is, as I showed you earlier, that when you turn on the PI3 kinase pathway or the MAP kinase pathway through RAS in either event, you should get increased glucose uptake, because this is the primary thing these, this pathway has evolved to control. And so we predict that cancer should have very high rates of glucose uptake compared to the surrounding normal tissue. And in fact, that was first observed 90 years ago by a German scientist named Otto Vorberg, who took out a rat tumor and compared it to the surrounding normal tissue and just asked how fast is glucose taken up into the tumor and what is it converted to. And he found that the tumor was taking up glucose as much as 100 times a higher rate than the surrounding normal tissue. And that ultimately became known as the Warburg effect. Uh, he got an old Nobel Prize for his work on mitochondria several years later. Uh, but this is today the thing he's most remembered for. Now, in fact, we take advantage of this in the clinic because you can use a radioactive form of glucose, F18-fluorodeoxyglucose, and do PET imaging and uh, be able to f identify tumors by this process. So a few years ago, we decided to engineer a mouse in which the one of the most frequently mutated gene, uh, sites on PI3 kinase, the 1047R, H1047R mutation, was engineered to be expressed in lung alveolar tissue in a doxycycline-inducible manner, so we could then turn on PI3 kinase and see what happens. And after about three or four months, the mice were having trouble breathing. We could go in and image them, and sure enough, they had developed a lung cancer, which a pathologist would call an adenocarcinoma, a lung adeno, non-small cell lung adenocarcinoma. And if we did PET imaging, sure enough, this tumor lit up like a Christmas tree. If we turned off PI3 kinase, which we could by either a drug or withdrawing the doxycycline to turn off the transgene expression, either case, within 48 hours, the glucose goes away, the tumor is still there, 
Uh, but by four days, the tumor shrinks, and by three weeks or so, the tumor has completely disappeared. So this tumor is initiated by PI3 kinase, and as long as it's small, it still requires PI3 kinase. But Bert's point that he made earlier, that the larger the tumor is, the higher the probability that it's going to evolve a mechanism of resistance, is absolutely true in these mouse models as well. In fact, maybe even more true in the mouse model. So when these tumors get large, and we've done this in breast as well, when the tumors get large, they invariably develop a resistance mechanism. They're no longer dependent on the initiating event. That's telling us that we have to go in early, as Bert was pointing out. Many drugs now are targeting PI3 kinase, or AKT. Activators of AMP kinase are being explored, and of course, tr drugs that hit mTOR, uh, some of which have already been improved, including Everolimus that I mentioned earlier. I left off all the drugs that are targeting the MAP kinase pathway, uh, most notably the RAF inhibitor that recently got approved, and of course many receptor tyrosine kinase drugs that are working. I'll focus on the PI3 kinase drugs. There are several that have been in the clinic. In fact, uh, more than 20 have been in the clinic now. Uh, I'll just briefly talk about the one that's actually probably likely to be approved first, the Gilead Science PI3 kinase delta inhibitor. This gene is not mutated, but it's required for growth of B cells, as we showed in our first mouse knockouts in B cell compartments back in the 90s, uh, B cell lineage absolutely requires PI3 kinase in order to grow. And so this has been targeted to B cell lymphomas. There are alpha-specific uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, both from Genentech and Novartis. This is the Novartis drug here. And then pan-PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, such as BKM120, which is one of the furthest along, again, from Novartis. Here's, this is a woman with a chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is a B-cell lymphoma, and uh, she was only 38 years old. She'd failed all, all types, all standard therapy, went on a clinical trial with the uh, Gilead Science uh, PI3 kinase inhibitor, uh, and this drug is really showing quite remarkable responses even in phase one. It's now gone through phase three, and in fact, uh, phase three trial was stopped because the, all the placebo control group was crossing over into the uh, uh, drug treatment side. Uh, so this drug is very likely to be approved soon. Uh, you can see the waterfall plots. Uh, this is zero down here, so many of the patients have complete response, but almost everyone with CLL responded, and many non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and mantle cell lymphomas. I should say T-cell lymphomas, as consistent with the mouse knockouts, where T-cells do not require PI3 kinase to grow, uh, showed that uh, it only works in B-cells, not in T-cells. This is the same woman, as I showed earlier, uh, three months after going on the drug. So you can see that all of that lymph node swelling uh, goes away very quickly. And so a lot of patients are, are showing good responses. So back to this FDG PET. Is this, now that we know that inhibitors of PI3 kinase should turn off the FDG PET, can we use this in the clinic to predict who's actually going to respond uh, early on in, in drug treatment? So we've been looking at this in a stand-up to cancer trials that, that uh, my team has been running uh, over the last uh, three years. And uh, this is a woman who's uh, 51 years old. She has uh, ER positive and HER2 positive and PIK3CA muted, mutated breast cancer. She went on standard of care, which is Luprol. Uh, Herceptin uh, progressed on this, went to Lepatinib, also progressed, uh, and uh, had, in fact, failed on all therapies. She, she can see this metastasis to the liver. This is an FTG PET. And this is the same woman one month after going on BYL-719, which targets the very same mutation, the PIK3CA mutant uh, PI3 kinase. So these kinds of responses are very exciting. However, many of the women, even if they have PIK3CA mutations, you don't see these responses, which means something else is driving the glucose uptake. And those women invariably fail to respond to the drug. If you don't see a PET response within a week or so, uh, almost certainly those patients are not going to benefit from the drug. And this is something we want to know early so they can get onto different therapies. This will also accelerate approval of the drugs if we select patients properly. Okay, I want to finish then uh, just by saying uh, in the last five minutes uh, something about why there is this strong connection between obesity, diabetes, and cancer, which has been confirmed now by multiple studies over the last few years. And what intrigued me about this and got me thinking about it is that the very subset of cancers that show a strong correlation between obesity, diabetes, and cancer are those that have PIK3CA mutations, endometrial cancer being the strongest. That's also where you see the most mutations, breast cancer, et cetera.
So what might be going on? And so we spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I should say that what you're hearing now is all hypothetical about what we think is going on, but I think it's probably true. Just because it's a model, as Bob says, doesn't mean it's necessarily false. <laughs> uh, so, uh, here's, this is what I told you earlier. Activation of PI3 kinase causes cancers, in particular epithelial cancers, and overeating, lack of exercise, genetic predisposition, ultimately leads to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So there's this event going on where at some stage between obesity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes, there's an increased risk of cancer for subsets of cancers, not all cancers. What's going on? We think it's a stage of insulin resistance that's actually causing this problem. And here's why. When you become insulin resistant, so the liver cannot respond to insulin efficiently, nor the muscle or fat, glucose levels rise and insulin levels rise. So the pancreas turns out more and more insulin. It also suppresses IGF-1 binding protein, so IGF-1, free IGF-1 also goes up. And so you have this massive increase by hundreds of folds, at least you know, 50, 100 fold increase in insulin, and free IGF-1 also goes up. So any tumor that has insulin receptor or IGF-1 receptor on its surface has the ability to respond to this and start growing. As long as the tumor is not insulin resistant, then it has the advantage over the muscle and liver and fat of responding to insulin. And we think that that's probably what's causing cancer. And again, it comes back to the fact that this correlation between obesity and diabetes and the subsets of cancers where we often see insulin receptor and PI3 kinase activated. There's a subset of prostate cancers, for example, that have these extremely high Gleason scores and also very frequently have high levels of insulin receptors. So this brown stain here is insulin receptor. This is benign prostate hyperplasia. You don't see it. You see it strongly uh, in these high Gleason score prostate cancers. So might then these prostate tumors with insulin receptor expressed be responding to insulin if you're insulin resistant. So insulin levels are going to be sky high. Is that driving the growth of these tumors? And that's what we're speculating. So what we think then happens is that once the tumor can respond to insulin and grow, it's going to develop additional mutations. In fact, the higher you metabolize glucose, the more rate ROS you spit out, the more mutations you get. And then anything that makes that insulin signaling pathway work better, like mutations of PIK3CA or loss of P10, is going to drive the tumor even faster. So that's why we think you select for P10 loss and PIK3CA in this subset of cancers that, that uh, correlate with diabetes and obesity. So basically what I'm saying then is that maybe it's con we need to keep insulin down in type 2 diabetics rather than glucose. Obviously, we want to keep glucose down, but it may be more important to keep insulin down. And the problem is when patients get to type, type 2 diabetes, two of the most popular treatments is to, is to give them insulin. And now you're giving them sky-high insulin. It's not like type 1 diabetics where you just give enough to bring it back to normal. You're getting 50 to 100 times more insulin to type 2 diabetics and so if the tumor has insulin receptor, you're potentially driving the growth of the tumor. Same thing with insulin secretagogues. They raise insulin levels. Other approaches, however, metformin, for example, suppresses gluconeogenesis in the liver, and that brings insulin levels down. Both bring glucose down, and the endocrinologists, are only, their job is to bring glucose down. They don't worry about insulin. Oncologists are beginning to worry about insulin, so I think we have to get this message across and do some real force uh, forward-thinking clinical trials to test these ideas. So if this is true, might metformin be our best drug for preventing cancer? And there are a host of retrospective analyses published over the last five years or so that very strongly support this idea, that the subset of type 2 diabetics given insulin versus, uh, sorry, given metformin versus insulin, res uh, have much lower deaths from cancer. So. I'm running out of time, or have run out of time, and so I will stop there and just once again leave the names of the people who did a lot of this work that I talked about. Okay, time for one question, if we're going to any questions. One question here. Yes. Pardon? Do you see mutation of multiple members of the network of your PI3, of the PI3K network in uh, cancer or just yes. a single? Yes, so it depends on the cancer type, but endometrial cancer, the one that most strongly correlates with diabetes, obesity, 
uh, has uh, in a given cell even, we can see this not only in the tumor, but even in a given cell, you can find a RAS mutation, a PIK3CA mutation, and a PIK3R1 mutation all going on simultaneously in the same patient, in the same cell in the same patient even. And so, and that's not uncommon at all. Colorectal cancer, you can find RAS mutations and PIK3CA uh, mutations simultaneously as well. So this uh, obviously creates a problem for therapy. And I think that's some of the reasons why the PI3 kinase inhibitors don't always work, even though you have a PIK3C mutation, because you might have a RAS mutation simultaneously. Thanks a lot, Lou. Okay. Lou, I remember when you visited CETUS in 1985 or 86, and you described your biochemical characterization and purification of PIP3 for the first time. It was brilliant biochemistry. I really appreciated it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you.